Welcome everyone. Today we are doing another BJC Fast Paper and we're going to do a general science paper. But before getting into that, I want you to remember, once you're going to do the exam, always write a school number, your candidate number, your initials, and your surname. That's very important for you to do so. All right, as mentioned, we're doing a general science paper. It is a paper two from the year 2021. It's a structure paper. All right, so let's dive into question number one. And question number one reads that the diagram shows the structure of a hibiscus flower. For part A, it's a correctly label the diagram to show the petals, ovary, and stigma on the hibiscus flower. All right, so let me put some lines. Uh, so this will be the petal. We have here the stigma. I'm going to just label uh, more than one stuff. And that's the ovary, what they ask us to do. You need to know this part as well. And you also need to know this part, which is the filament. All right, so those are the basic things that you need to know. Okay, yeah, the sepal as well. All right, and you also could also know, all right, let me just say this. Let's put all of these in. So I'm going to leave six of them. They ask for three, but you need to know all of these, all right? So, um, so this is a petal, all right? And here we have the stigma. I missed one. I'm going to put the next line there. We have the stigma, all right? And there's another line that I need to put right here, which is this middle portion here let's put it all the way out so i have space to do that all right and so it is called the style and this bottom portion here is called the ovary and then this small piece on top of that little thing that like a like an antenna it is actually called the anther and then the part that holds the antenna in place, like antenna, is called the filament. All right. And then we have these small leaf-like structures at the base here. They are called the sepal. All right. Um, point to note is that the stigma, style, and ovary, that's the female part of the flower. So stigma, style, ovary is the female part of the flower. These three are the female parts of the flower. And the female part is called the carpel or pistil. And the male part of the flower, which made up of the anther and filament, is called the stamen. All right, so just need to remember that as well. All right, so let's get into question number two. Oh, well, part B of number one. And so the diagram shows the parts of a bean seed. It's a study the diagram then answer the questions. All right, so we have um, a section called Q, a part called S, a part call, called R. All right? And it said, write the letter of the part which fits each description. And so for A, you see a seed leaf that stores food. And so the part that stores food is actually called a cotyledon. And so this part here is called a cotyledon. Let's just quickly label them. Um, so this is the cotyledon. All right, and this will be the radical. All right, so that's the radical there. And this part here is the pleomule. All right, so those are the parts of the seed. And the outermost part of the seed here, which is the outer line, that is called the testa, which is the cause, so called the seed coat, the testa, or seed coat all right so those are the parts of the seed all right and this is a dicotyledon seed just to make mention of that as well all right it's a bean seed so it's a dicotyledon so notice it says a bean seed and beans are dicotyledon all right just to mention that as well all right so let's go down into putting the answers here it said that um, a seed leaf that stores food and so the cotyledon is the seed leaf that will store food. So this is going to be S. Now, it's an embryonic root. So embryonic root means the first root that is formed before the plant actually turns into a self-sustaining plant. So when it's germinating, the embryonic root here is going to be R, which is the radical. So the radical forms roots, okay? 
and the plumule forms shoot. And so part three said the part of the embryo from which develops into the shoot, and that is Q, which is the plumule. The plumule forms the shoot. Part C, so on the diagram, draw a line to, to label the tester, and we already done that, so that is good. So we have labeled the tester already, which is the outer part of the leaf itself. So the tester is this line and the outside part right here. So that's the tester. All right, so next question here now is said, what is the function of a tester? The tester is to protect the seed, okay? So it is to protect the seed. All right, so that's the function there to protect the seed. And then it's to identify the difference between the structures of a bean seed and a maize seed. A maize seed is a corn, just to mention that. Maize means corn, so it's a corn. All right, so that's a, that's a scientific name for corn. Actually, it's a maize. So once you see maize, it's a corn. And so the difference here is that the bean seed has... Um, the, let me say the, the maize first. So the maize, the maize here, um, the maize, as one cotyledon. All right. Um, so while the bean has two cotyledons. All right, so we have two cotyledons for the bean, and the maize only, only has one cotyledon because the monocotyledon. So corn is a monocot, and beans, they are dicots. All right, so that in that question. So question number two now, it said that light is a form of energy that we can see and has several properties. So we can see light, and it has several properties. All right, it's a study diagram and answer the questions. So this is a light wave that is shown right here. And we have different parts of the wave. All right, so let's quickly see what the axis first. If not, I will label the entire structure here of this wave. So how does light travel? And light travel in a straight line. So they travel in a straight line. All right, so light travels, light travels in a straight line. All right. So that's a simple direct answer right there. And it said, name the following parts of the light wave. And so um, we have three structures here to label. And they have four letters. So I'm going to label all of them. So I'm going to label J. That is not shown here. So F is the highest point of a light wave, and it's called the crest. So the highest point of a Light wave is called a crest. And just to make a note right here that this type of wave is called a transverse wave. Okay, so this is what we call a transverse wave. The light waves are transverse waves. And sound waves, they are longitudinal waves. So that's something you also need to note as well. And they travel differently um, compared to light waves. Um, in fact, they, they look even different because they're not looking like a up and down type of thing, like a zigzag type. What they look like is they look like lines, like, like vertical lines moving along a path. So I'm going to show you what a longitudinal wave looks like. So you have some lines like that. Some of them are far apart, and then you have some that are really, really, really close. And we have special names for those. Um, we have compression and we have refraction. The ones that are very, 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 very close together, we call those compressions. And the ones that are very far, we call them refraction. So you also need to know about the properties of sound waves as well. All right? So just to mention that. Uh, but let's get into G. G now is the distance from the rest position to the highest or the lowest point. So I'm going to say that G could also be here as well. I just want to point it out. So G is not only from the bottom, but it's, it can also be this as well. So I want you to know that, that this can also be G. Anywhere from the rest position, which is this undisturbed line going across like that, to the highest point or to the lowest point, it is the same thing, and it is called the amplitude. All right, so I want you to know that that's the amplitude there. And so H is what you call the trough, which is the lowest point of the 
wave, the transverse wave. Now, J, let us put J right here. They didn't ask us for J, but let's put J. And J equals what they call the wavelength. So the wavelength is the distance from two equal points on the wave. So from two crests, from a crest to another crest, that is a wavelength. Or a trough to another trough, that's a wavelength. So once it's two equal points, no matter what where the point is, once they're equal or consecutive equal points, that's a wavelength. So let's just carry that again or state it again one more time. Is that from one point to another consecutive point, that is a wavelength. So so equal consecutive points, that is a wavelength. It could be a crest to another crest or a trough to another trough. And they must be consecutive, which means behind each other. All right, let's go to B. It says light behaves differently when it strikes different objects, which is true. So for A, you notice it bounces right back off at an angle. But however, in this situation here, this is a container and water or a liquid is in this container. And you can see the image here and you see a coin at the bottom here. So this image of the coin on top here, let me just kind of highlight that so you see exactly what I'm talking about. So here is the object of the coin. That's the coin itself. And the image of the coin is formed right here. Okay. There's a person looking into the container, looking at the coin. And here's the name the process that takes place in A and also B. So let's name the processes that take place here. And so in, in A, what is taking place is something called reflection. So reflection is taking place right here. All right, so let's say ref reflection. And um, I want to give you a like, um, definition for what reflection is. And reflection is when uh, you see the image of the object. All right, so here now is that the uh, image. Of the object is seen. All right, so that's a reflection right there. All right, so for B now, it's what you call refraction. So B is refraction. And refraction now is the bending of light. There's a bending of light. All right, so that's what it is. So once light is bent or bent, we call that refraction. All right, and notice, if you notice here, let me show where the bending is taking place. So notice right here where I'm putting this um, highlighting right now. That's where the bending takes um, taking place. So the coin, the light goes up, then bend. That's refraction, the bending of light. Now for part three, it said, is the surface... Is the surface at A luminous or non-luminous? And this is going to be non-luminous because non-luminous means it does not produce its own light. All right? So luminous uh, objects, they produce their own light. So this is a non-luminous. All right, so if you have a mirror, for example, you can put it near a light or in the sun, and you notice it reflects a light onto something else, right? So it's not producing its own light, but it reflects light. All right, the moon uh, does the same thing. All right, stars, just the same. All right, here it said make one observation about the coin in diagram B. So if you notice the coin, uh, let's go back to the coin. So the, urge, the, the coin uh, is at the bottom of the container, but it is seen at a higher height. All right, notice where the image is seen. So we're going to talk about the observation we notice here. We see that image, the, the image of the coin is higher in the water, so that could be the observation there. And you can state it in different ways, but this is the way I'm going to state it, is that uh, it appears to be shallow, okay? So it appears to be shallow or at our shorter depth or at a shorter depth, all right? So that's how I'm going to state it. You can also state it that it looks higher or appears higher than the actual coin. Okay, the image is higher than the actual coin. So it's not as deep in the water or the liquid. All right, so that's the uh, observation. Again, you don't have to use the exact words that I use. Want to explain it that it is at a higher depth 
or um, higher in terms of the water and the coin is deeper in the water, then yes, you'll be good to go. Here's to explain why, the observa why this observation happened. And let me just, as a two mark, there's a two mark. So there are actually two things really um, take place. And so let's state it right here is that light, um, light from the coin, um, the light from the coin, let me take one of those M's, light from the coin bends, right? Uh, bends at the surface of the water, at the surface of the water. So there's bending taking place there at the surface of the water. I'm going to show you actually. So you actually see this. So it bends at the surface of the water. All right, just to mention that. But, but, I'm going to tell you what the but is. That's the next point right there. Let's go back and show you. So you notice where bending is taking place. I'm pointing to right here. Now, um, bending takes place at the surface of the water. Just to make mention of that. And you need to know that. Let me just kind of circle that for you. So this is where bending takes place, at the surface of the water. But notice the eye, there's a straight line going towards the image, right? So that's where, um, that's what actually caused it to look like it's actually a shallow, shallower than it actually is. So let me just go back into this now and start answering this. But the eye, but the eye now, but the eye, um, let's say the eyes, but the eyes, Trace the coin or trace the light, trace the light, trace the coin or the light in a straight line. All right, so while the light is bending, the eye is seeing it in terms of a straight line. All right, and that's why it appears shallower than the actual coin itself. All right, so yeah, so that's the two marks right there. Well, question number three, and we are halfway through. It said the use of Elements depends on their properties. Study the picture and, sh and answer their questions. So here we have a iron in cooking pot. So this is iron. Uh, the pot is made up of cooking. Uh, the, the pot is made, of cook is made of iron, really. And then carbon in wood. So the charcoal or the wood is made up of carbon. And the pot is made up of iron. All right. Is the iron and carbon are both elements is a which element is a metal and which is a non-metal and i know for sure that um, we all know that um, the metal here is iron as you know the name iron uh, you can know that's a metal and so the non-metal here is carbon all right so this is carbon and without doubt you know that iron is definitely a metal all right all right so it's a name to other non-metals and there are many non-metals that you can list here and, and so it's very difficult for you to get this wrong, especially if you know the periodic table. But what I'm going to do is to list some very common ones that I think you need to know. All right. And so sulfur is one that I know you need to know for sure. All right. And um, when you're doing magnetism, you actually use sulfur for that experiment because magnets cannot attract the sulfur. And so sulfur is used in the magnetic, uh, magnetism um, experiment, a um, very simple one. And you use iron as well. Um, so, yes, those are very, very common ones that are used in the lab. So, sulfur is one. Um, chlorine is another one. And you use chlorine in some reactions as well. So, you have so many options you can talk about. Oxygen that we breathe in is also a non-metal. And fluorine. All right. Because, yeah. So, definitely. All right. So, these are some non-metals that you should know. All right. All right. So, great. So, we have those. And again, if you know others, um, like, for example, iodine and so on. So there are many. There are so many different um, non-metals you can actually use. Phosphorus and so on. So there are many. But do remember the ones that you know, and they are in the group um, 5, 6, or 7 of the periodic table. All right. So you can just go back to the periodic table and know your non-metals. For part B here, it said the list gives some properties of elements. And so here are the list we have. We say that it's brittle, can be hammered into shape, dull, conduct electricity, poor conductor of electricity. And also here we say it is uh, shiny. So what the table asks us to put each property into the correct column. And so the properties of metal and also non-metals. Um, so to make it easy and faster, I don't need to write everything back in the table. What I'm going to do is to put it beside the words 
and you will know that it will go into the table. All right. So instead of writing it, uh, motherfucker, I, I could just go and get it. I let, uh, let me just go ahead and write it. All right. Um, brittle is non metals. All right. So I'll just put it right here. Are you going to be a little bit longer than um, just putting the M and the N on top? But anyhow, just let's do it according to what the exam will look like. So non metal here. Oh, I'm writing non metal. It is brittle. All right. So it's brittle. Non metals are brittle. All right, and it can be hammered in shape. This will be um, metals. Metals can be hammered in shape. So, can be hammered into shapes. All right. So, that is a. All right. So, let me just say into shape. All right. Put it right there. Good. So, the next point now is a dull. And non metals are dull. So, I can put, put it right here. Non metals are dull. All right, so non-metals, they are dull. Let's put it right here. All right, so non-metals, they are dull. Um, and next one here is a good conductor of electricity. So good conductors of electricity is metal. So metals are good conductors, good conductors of electricity. All right, so good conductors of electricity. All right, so all right, let's put electricity at the bottom right there. I miss out the N. All right, of electricity. All right, yeah. So, and there's a poor conductors of electricity now, which would be the non metal. So, this is a poor conductor of electricity. Poor conductor of electricity. All right, yeah. So, Metals are good conductors of electricity, and non-metals, they are poor conductors of electricity. And it's a shiny. Shiny is for metals. Metals are shiny, non-metals are dull. All right, so shiny is for the metal. All right, so those are the properties that we list there. And also point out that um, while metals are good conductors of electricity, they are also good conductors of heat as well, just to make a mention there. And of course, non-metals are poor conductors of heat. So uh, non-metals are real opposite of the metals, all right? All right? So let's go to the next part of the question. Is identify one other property of, of metals not found in the list. And I just mentioned one just now to say that they are good conductors of heat. So that's the next one right there. But there are others too. Let me just give you a number of them, right? Let's start right here. So metals are good conductors of heat. I'm going to put some others on the line. So they are good conductors of heat. All right, so that's another one there. Others that you can also know is that they are ductile. And ductile means that they can draw into wires. They can be made into wires. And not only ductile, they are generally hard. So they're generally hard. And they also tend to be denser than um, non-metal. So those are four of the properties that were not listed in the that were not given in the list is identify one other property of non-metals and non-metals here they are poor conductors of um, heat all right that was not, was not mentioned poor conductors of heat all right so that's why you can use a wooden spoon to cook with and you do not get burned all right they are poor conductors of heat all right so yes um again they tend to be softer than um than metals, they are less dense as well. All right, so those are some prop extra properties right there we can mention. All right, so next part of the question here said, in the box are the names of three metals. We have copper, iron, and sodium. And let's make a note right there. They are, okay, they're all metals. It said that in the, in the statement. They're all metals, copper, iron, and sodium. It said, which one of these is not a good metal for making cooking pot? Give a reason for your answer. And it's a two mark one to name it. And it's sodium because the copper is, is a hard metal. You know how you know it is actually showing the, in, the, in, the, in the pot that was given the picture. So the answer here is actually sodium. And the reason why sodium cannot be used to make pot is going to be a dangerous thing. I will tell you. One, it is softer. So it's a really soft metal, right? So one answer here is to this because it is soft. It's a soft metal. You can cut sodium with a knife. I will tell you. Yeah. 
And one of the most important ones that I think that you cannot use it to big pot, it is very reactive with water. So the so soft is one answer there, and it's also very reactive with water. So imagine you cook, you're cooking, and the pot is reacting with the water. A matter of fact, I will tell you this. If you react sodium with water, it will catch fire, right? So, so sodium in water will give an explosion, all right? Very reactive with water. So imagine you're cooking your, your, your rice or your peas and rice, and your, and your pot explodes, boom, you know? And you see fire catching in, in the house, your, your house burn down. All right, so yeah, very reactive with water, and it produces fire or a slash explosion in the presence of water. So it's a very bad thing to even think about sodium being um, a pot, unless you are suicidal. All right, question number four. So this question is about forces. It's a study the diagrams carefully, then answer the questions. All right, so here we have a, um, a, a person diving. And then we have here um, somebody rubbing their hands together, which is in, di in diagram Q. And then we have a tree and an apple. Let's call it an apple tree. And the apple fall into the person's head. All right. So uh, let's now go into the part of the question and see exactly what they're asking about these diagrams. All right. All right, so here's a defined it, the term force. And force is a very simple thing to define. A force is simply a push or a pull. Okay, so it's a simple push or a pull. So a force is a push or pull. That's what a force is, a push or a pull. So part B said identify the type of forces acting on each of the objects in the diagrams P and Q. So the force in diagram um, P and Q, let's talk about the person diving. If a person is diving, the person is in water. So the water will put an upward force called upthrust force onto the person, or what they call a buoyant force. So we have two words you could use here. We have what they call a buoyant force. So we have buoyant force or upthrust force. Okay, or upthrust. Okay, so buoyant force or upthrust force. All right, yes. So those are the two possible names for that force that the person is actually diving. Upthrust, because the water is pushed onto the person and create a buoyancy. So we call it buoyant force or upthrust force. A person rubbing their hands together, you're going to call friction. So you're going to get frictional force here. So this is going to be um, frictional force or just friction will be sufficient. So if it's a friction alone, that's fine. Uh, buoyant force, upthrust, yeah, that's also fine. All right. Um, what about the person, though, under the tree? The apple is falling because of gravity. So this is a gravitational force. Let's just put it right here. All right, so that's the force of gravity that caused the, the apple to fall from a tree. All right, and it's a study diagram R and identify, and identify um, one force acting on the apple as it falls from a tree. We just talked about that just now. It's gravitational force or gravity. So the force of gravity, all right? So gravitational force or the force of gravity. All right, so let's put gravitational force in bracket, all right? Gravitational force or simple gravity. All right, so define the force found in R. So what is gravity? So gravity now is the attraction. So the, this, is, this is what they call the attraction. The attraction of objects. The attraction of objects towards the center of the earth, okay, so the center of the earth. So that's what uh, gravitation or gravity is defined as. And so objects will attract towards the center of the earth and that's why they fall towards the surface of the earth. A part, do you know, it's the weight, uh, the weight and mass of an object are directly proportional. Explain this statement. So if they're directly proportional, it means that as one increases, the other one will also increase. So this is going to say as Mass increases because weight is dependent upon mass. I'm going to show you the formula. So as mass increases, all right, the weight of the object, all right, the weight of the object also increased. 
All right. All right. So just to mention here that weight, W, let's call this W, weight is equal to mass times gravity. All right. And if gravity is the same, um, if mass is the same thing all the time, then it based upon, the weight is based upon gravity, right? But the bigger the mass is, the bigger the weight. Okay. So objects with bigger mass will have a larger weight. All right. Just to mention that right there. So weight is equal to mass times gravity, mg. It's a give the scientific unit for mass, and mass is kg, which is kilogram. So this is kg or kilograms, okay? So let's put kilogram. Let's say give the unit. So the unit is the kg, which is a symbol. I never say name the unit, but I'm going to name it for you. It's called kilograms, all right? So just to mention that. But the unit, once they give unit, you give the symbol unit. If you say name the unit, then you write the name, all right? So I just want to mention that uh, to make sure that we get our maximum marks. All right, or we follow the instructions carefully. But part three, though, we said, why are astronaut, uh, astronauts um, able to float around in outer space? So astronauts, they can float around simply because um, in space, there are little gravitational force. All right, so here are going to say, because, uh, uh oh. All right, so because uh, there is. Little, and not no, because everywhere has some form of gravity. Just that the gravity is so small that it is not pushing the person down towards the object or to the planet. And so everywhere you find gravity. Okay. So here now is because um, there is little gravity or gravitational force. A little gravity. Uh, let's say gravitational force. A little gravitational force in outer space. Okay, yeah, so very little gravitational force in outer space. All right, so that's the answer there. Let's see if this question is, we have more parts of this question. Oh, yeah. All right, last part here for this question. This question, again, is all the questions were um, 10 marks so far, and I think you have six questions on this. Is a student run, um, runs down the corridor to get to the front of the lunch line. They sh you should not um, cut, cut in lines, but yeah. It said the corridor is 50 meters long, it takes him 10 seconds to run down the corridor itself, right? To run down all the corridor itself. Is a calculate his average speed. So if it takes um, 10 seconds to run down the corridor, and the corridor is 50 meters long, then his average speed, let's talk about what speed is his first. So speed is equal to distance over time. This is equal to D over T, distance over time. All right, that's what the formula is. Distance over time, that's what speed is. So therefore, speed now is equal to distance, which is the 50 meters, all right, divided by um, time, and that is 10 seconds. The time in seconds is 10. And so 50 divided by 10 will give you 5 meters per second, all right? So that is the average speed right there. Very easy to work out for a simple two marks. All right, next, next question. And this is our second to last question here. And this diagram shows the water cycle. And the water cycle is something that you should know. Um, very important cycle as well. So we have A, B, and C. So we have three things there. We have water. We have water. We have rainfall. We have the sun. All right, but let's see exactly what is going on here now. It's so a name the change of state labeled A and B in the diagram. So A is where water is leaving from the earth up into the atmosphere. And it is, it is caused by the, sun, the, or the heat from the sun. And then when it reaches the atmosphere, at B, it turns into clouds or enters the cloud. And so, and then C is coming back down. So let's talk about all of, all of those. I, we, I could do it on the diagram, but let's just put it on the lines here. So A is evaporation. All right, so A is going to be evaporation because what in the lake or the pond or whatever that is, um, or the ocean, uh, more likely a pond, all right, it is called evaporation. So water leaving the Earth's surface in the form of steam or gas is called evaporation. All right, so that's evaporation there. And B, after the water is evaporated, all right, it will go into the cloud, and so that is what we call their condensation. So that so B is going to be condensation. All right, so condensation takes place there. All right, and um. So let's see what else they ask us here. Um, so let's go down to the next part of the question here. It's a water in the lake 
is in a liquid state. So it's in liquid state. It's a state of properties of liquids. All right, so liquids have many properties. I'm going to try to put all of them on this um, two lines. Hopefully, they could hold here. So one property of um, liquid that you should know is that there is no fixed shape. So liquid have, li liquids, they do not have fixed shape. No fixed shape. And since they have no fixed shape, though, they take the shape of the container. So I must make a, a note right here. Take uh, liquids, um, take shape of container. Take the shape of their container. All right. So whatever the shape of the container is, when you put the liquid in, the liquid is going to look just like the container, right? Um, the other property here that we can mention here is that there is a fixed volume. Liquids have fixed volume. So they do have fixed volume, okay? All right, another property that we can mention here is that the particles are moderately fast. So just say the particles. So the particles are liquid. Uh, all right, so the particles in a liquid move moderately fast, right? Move moderately fast. So it's not too fast, not too slow. So gas moves faster than liquid, but liquid moves faster than um move faster than um solid. So liquid moves faster than solid, but gas move faster than liquid. All right, moderately fast. All right, so not too slow, not too fast. Another property we can also mention is that the, the particles move easily over each other. And right, let's put it here on this side right here. All right, we don't, we don't have enough uh, more space there. So next one here, the last one we'll talk about there. The particles move freely over each other. They move freely over each other. All right. Yes, yeah, so the particles actually move over each other. In gas, the particles don't move over each other. They move away from each other and far apart, right? Solid, no, the particles are fixed and just vibrate about that fixed position. All right, so just to mention that there. All right, here now is so the diagram presents a soil sample that has been shaken up and allowed to settle. So you put some water into the soil, you shake it up and let it settle. And then here now we're going to ask now, let's see what they ask in here. I said, which layer represents humus? And the top one is the humus. All right. And so the humus will be the top. So this is going to be um, A will be our answer there. All right. And as they go down, the particles get larger and larger. So the bottom will be like, like your sand and your gravel and your stone. And then after that, will, D will be your, your clay. And then C will be like your um, other type of um, soil. So it'll be... Think about the particle size, right? So larger particles will be at, at, at the bottom, which, which will be your rocks and, uh, and so on, right? So you need to know the, the, the soil profile. You need to know that as well. So you need to practice your soil profile. All right, so what I could do, I could, I could um, give you a quick, 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 quick label for, 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 for that. All right, so generally, we call this here as again, this is humus. I just put humus there. And um, the humus. And we call the other section here, which will be your topsoil. So this would be like a topsoil right here. All right. So that's your topsoil. All right. That's your topsoil. All right. And going down, as I'm saying, this would be like your rocks, just to mention that. And it could be also be, be sand as well. So it could be sand, it could be rocks. So there are a number of different labels actually could give to you could, you could give to that um, the bottom part so it's rocks and so on. All right. So what is also important when you think about the soil, you talk about nutrients in the soil. So the soil provides nutrients for for plant as well. I need to know you need need to know that for sure. Um, you need to know that for sure, for sure, for sure, sure. All right, and just to mention one more thing before I go to the next um, part of the question here, is that the ones in the middle, uh, let me just label those, which I didn't label, those are the subsoil here. We call these the subsoil, so let's put that in. All right, so we have um, C and D be your subsoil. And, um, no, a matter of fact, let me just quickly do this, so let me take this out. 
um, because the clay is normally at the bottom. So let's call this clay. This bottom one is clay, and then we have this is our subsoil. Let me make sure um, do them separately. All right, yeah. So you have a humus, a topsoil, a subsoil, and a clay, and then you have your rock. All right. And again, um, if you have sand in it, if it's sand, then it could also be sand. All right. So it depends on where you get the soil from. So different um, soil will be labeled differently. Some soil you only have like three different layers, not four. So it depends. I'm saying depends, right? But just in case you see this one, which which is how many this is five. The humus on top, topsoil, subsoil, clay, and then you have your um, your rocks or your sediments, all right? Which would be your every sediment. Again, it could be sand. All right. So please study this diagram. Make sure you know it, and make sure you're able to reproduce this if you should ask to do it. Again, it's a good experiment to do at school as well. To, to get some soil, put it into a container, like a beaker, mix it with water, and then you, you leave it there and let it settle, and you will see it. You can do it at home, a matter of fact. You get a, um, a, a bottle that is clear or a cup that you can see through. Um, you shake it up with some water, leave it for a little while, and then you'll come back, you'll notice that um, you see the, the soil separate in different layers. All right, depends on where you live, you may not see much, much layer because you don't find much clay within the Bahamas itself, right? And it's a dig really deep. All right, so sometimes you don't find clay at all in some in places. I just mentioned that. All right, next here is a what is humus? And humus, now, we define it as this is that this is a rich, uh, so this is be the, the rich part. So this is going to be the rich part of the soil of the soil that was formed that was formed from decayed that was formed from decayed uh, decayed plants and animal materials right so plants and animal materials all right yeah so it'd be lovely, it'd be truly lovely for you to do the soil profile experiment at home. Get some soil from the outside of a yard or different parts of a yard. And you, it's a good experiment for you to do to see the different types of soil in different parts of your yard. So you can take some at the back of a yard, the side of a yard, and the front of a yard, and do a soil profile on each of them and see if there's a difference between the soil in different parts of a yard. All you need to do is put them into a cup, um, a, a transparent cup, pour some water over it, mix it, then leave it to settle for a while. It could be a day or hours, and then you go back and you see that there's a big difference in terms of the layers. All right, um, let's look at part three now. We say two components of the soil are water and air. State why each one is important. So why water is, why air is important. Let's talk about air first. Air is important for many reasons. And so I'm going to give you two main reasons why air is important. It, well, technically, you need to have only one because there's a two marks, but I'm going to give you two, the two main reasons here. One is to help seed to germinate. The water helps um, seeds to germinate because um, seeds need um, water to germinate. The other point that you can make right here is that um, water is important in soil uh, to provide. Oh, yeah. No, that's, I'm talking about air. Yeah, I talk about water. I talk about water next. So the air helps seed to germinate for sure because seed needs um, oxygen to germinate. And let's put oxygen in bracket because not just any part of the air but oxygen um seeds need oxygen so let me put that in bracket for you right here so it needs oxygen from the air okay oxygen is needed for germination now air is also needed as well to provide oxygen for organism within the soil so air provides um oxygen provides oxygen for let's say let's call them soil organism all right soil organisms and so we're talking about things like earthworms and so on. We're thinking of, we're talking about uh, any animals or organisms or even small plants that are found within the soil. They need um, oxygen or they may need carbon dioxide, depending on what type of organism they are. But most um, animal-like organisms require oxygen. Um, if you have a small plant-like organism within the soil, then they will require carbon dioxide. Now, water is there for many reasons. Again, what is needed for germination? I could, I could also mention this. Um, so it, um, water helps um, seeds to germinate, okay? To germinate. So definitely, again, germination 
is another big thing for water and, and, and air. Not only that, but water also allow plants to take up um, minerals. So water helps um, plants to take up mineral, right? To take up minerals. All right, so min are mineral salts, right? So minerals are mineral salts. Not only that, um, soil, um, water also help soil organisms as well. And plants also take up water from the soil for photosynthesis. So plants need water as well for photosynthesis. So water is taken up from the soil to carry out the food making process. And so here they will say to help um, plants uh, helps plants make food. And this process here is called photosynthesis. I must put it in bracket. All right, so photosynthesis. All right, and even soil, organism, um, soil organisms use water as well to carry out their functions, all right? Just as we need water, the organisms within the soil, they also need water as well to carry out their functions. All right, so water in the soil is very important. I here now we said to investigate the permeability of soil. When we said the permeability of soil, we're talking about how things can pass through it, how porous the soil, the soil is. The student put four different types of soil into funnels. They poured 300 centimeters cube of water into each soil and measured how much water passed through in five minutes. Study the picture and answer the questions. So let's jump into the picture first. All right, so what can you note? What do you notice dif uh, that is different between these pictures? Um, you cannot see exactly clearly what the soil looks like, but the only thing that is noticeable is the water level. This one is the lowest one, so let's put the lowest one right there. There's the least amount of water, and then this one will be the most water. All right, that is passed through the soil, and then this is a little bit lower than this, and then this is a one. So this will be in terms of the Highest, this will be the highest one. So that will be number one, number two, number three, and number four in terms of the amount of water passed through. So the one is the most water, four is the least amount of water. So part one now is saying which sample most likely represents sandy soil. And sandy soil have um, sandy soil has a lot of space between it because the, soil, uh, the sand particles are larger. And so, therefore, it is more porous, which means it will be more permeable. And so, therefore, um, C will be our answer there because um, if you notice, the most water passed through it. Is it give a reason for your answer? And the reason for your answer, right, is that um, um, the most water passed through sample C. Okay? So, the most water um, um, passed through soil C. Okay? All right, so yeah, that will be answer right there. All right? Because um, the other soil, like clay and so on, clay will, on top soil, they, they, they will not allow much water to pass through compared to sand. Sand is bigger and larger particles. So um, definitely. All right, so number six. It said the, diagram, the diagrams show foods, foods from various food groups. So we have the fruits and vegetables, meat and fish, bread and cereal. And it said, which food group is the best source for? And A and number one is the providing body with energy. And that will be our carbohydrates, which is bread and cereal. The carbohydrates is what gives us our energy. And bread is a carbohydrate. Cereal is also a carbohydrate as well. Um, and just to mention, too, fruits do have some carbohydrates because fruits have sugar. Okay? But, the, but the major one here is the starch, starch food, which is bread and cereal. Okay, so they are the major one that will provide us with um, our energy. Um, vitamins and minerals, that will be our fruits and vegetables. Our fruits and vegetables are very good in providing us um, with, um, with our vitamins and um, our minerals, so fruits and vegetables. So that's why you need to eat your vegetables. So you can get your, 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 your vitamins and your minerals to stay healthy. It's a growth and repair, and that is meat. And fish, because meat and fish provide us with protein. And proteins are very important um, in terms of our growth, producing new cells, and also repair of our bodies as well. So meat and fish provide us with proteins. And proteins are very important in our growth, development, and repair. For part B, 
Part B state that identified a mineral and a deficiency disease found when this mineral is short in so um, is in short supply. And here we can uh, actually name a number of them. And so let's talk about a number of deficiency diseases that you should know. But I'm going to give you the three common ones that you should know. I know I'm talking about minerals. Notice this knocks, did not ask about vitamins. So you have some that many deficiency of vitamins and something will happen. I could talk about those um, after. But here you have iron. Iron is one. And if you're locking iron, what you're going to have is a condition called anemia. Okay, so anemia. And if you lock in calcium, which is a, another common one, so calcium. If you lack calcium, what you're going to get is something called rickets. Okay, so you're going to end up with rickets. And one more here is iodine. That, so these are the ones that you should know. They are common ones. Iodine. And iodine is your goiter. All right? You're going to get goiter, which is a swelling under the neck. All right? Anemia is when you fail to produce enough um, hemoglobin in the red blood cells or you do not produce enough red blood cells. And so, therefore, you become weak and pale. Rickets now is when the bones become soft and brittle, right? And goiter, you see that ball-like structure underneath your neck, all right? That means that your, your, your thyroid gland is swollen. All right, so define the term, the term balanced diet, all right? And let's talk about what a balanced diet is. And a uh, ba balanced diet for you is not the same thing as um, for me. Uh, every, every person may have a different balanced diet. So a balanced diet is based upon a number of things. It depends on gender. It depends on the occupation. It depends on the work. It depends on physical activities. There are so many different things. Even age, your balanced diet is also depending on the age. All right, so a number of things affect your balanced diet because a person who is, a, a, let's say, a baby, for example, an infant, an infant requires much more proteins than an adult because the, the young child is actually growing faster. They need to make much more cells, so they need more proteins than other substances or other nutrients. All right, so that's very important. All right, so let's talk about the balanced diet now. So a balanced diet is now is a diet, is a diet, that contains all, and put this in uppercase, all the nutrients, all the nutrients, all the nutrients in their correct, right? In their correct, let me put here correct. This is going to be important. Their correct proportion. All right, so make sure highlighting all and proportion. Right, so very important there. So they must be in the correct amount. Right, as again, I'm saying why I'm saying that because not everybody will have the same balanced diet. It depends on a number of different factors. It's to explain what can what can happen if a person takes in more calories than they need on a daily basis. So the same thing here. Um, I may require a lot of carbohydrates because I do a lot of physical activity um, activities. Persons who who play sports, for example, may need a lot of carbohydrates. But a person who sit on a desk all day, sit around a desk all day doing, um, just barely moving, really, only their hands and so on. They need less um, carbohydrates. All right? All right, so or a person who sleep and watch TV all day, they need little to no carbohydrates because they are doing nothing, yeah? All right, so, you know, it's ex explain uh, what can happen here. And it's simple here. The person will gain weight. All right, or simply depending on how much they can become overweight as well, more likely going to become overweight, or the person may become obese. All right, so that's that to mention that right there. All right, so part E of this question is so that diabetes is a non communicable disease that is prevalent in the Bahamas. Which food substance, when found in excess in the blood, um, can result in diabetes? And this is Glucose, the so glucose is the name of that substance, and I'm going to put sugars because glucose is a sugar. Okay, so but glucose is the answer. Okay, glucose or sugar. So too much blood sugar level uh, leads to diabetes, or what they call diabetes. All right, so here now it said that a group of students conducted an experiment to test for the presence of a particular nutrient in a food sample. It said they, they follow the instructions as shown in the diagram. And so the first thing they rub 
um, food sample on a paper and to a paper and leave it to dry. So they rub the food on the paper, leave the paper to uh, um to dry. It's a two, it's a translucent stain appears around um sample when held up to light. So when you put the, the paper up to the light, you see um translucent stains around it. And this is what they call the grease spot test. Let me just make sure make a note of that. So it's called the um the grease spot test. All right. And what you use this to test for is what nutrient were the student testing for in the food sample. And this here is um fats. Because fats will give you that little um translucent type of color or on a paper, especially when you dry it. The purpose, the purpose of drying it, uh, if you know this is a leaf to dry, is because if you wet the paper with water, it cannot give that similar effect. But when you dry the paper now and it's still there, then you know that it is definitely oil. All right, and so here is the end of this paper review. And so again, I wish you luck on the examination and I will talk to you soon.